It's my privilege and honor to introduce you to somebody you already know. You've known them longer than I've known them. But Nick and Laurel Shaler are very special to me, and uh, they're going to come and share a little bit about their adoption journey. And then Barry will uh, have the invocation. Good morning. Dr. Jimerson had asked us just to take a couple minutes to share briefly about our adoption journey, what the sanctity of human life means to us, and a couple points that I think are really important that we want to share is adoption is never second best or a second choice. We have listened to God's calling on how he is going to grow our family and add to it. And we believe that adoption is the way that he's going to do that. The second thing is that Christians, we are all called in some form or another to preserve human life and to help those less fortunate, whether it's orphans or widows. And it says so in the scripture. I'll read from you James 1, verse 27. It says this, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans, and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, as Sanctity of Life Sunday, um, we're going to be hearing a message about both the issue of decreasing abortion and increasing adoption. And statistics are really hard to find, but um, it's believed that there are about 30 waiting families for every infant that is adopted. Yet we know that the abortion clinics are very busy. Um, and as believers, it's our call to walk through this journey with those who are in unplanned pregnancies. Because if we are gonna be pro-life, we have to be supportive of all life and walking alongside them in a, in a very difficult time so that they don't turn to what they perceive to be the easy way out, which is abortion. Um, Nick mentioned that two of our main points. One is we don't believe that adoption is second best. We don't believe that we're called to adopt because we don't have biological children. We're called to adopt because that's what God wants from us. And it's really hard to understand all of this, but a wise man once told me that God can hit straight with a crooked stick. So even though we don't completely understand how all of this works, we do know that we're going to adopt because God has called us to this. And when we pray for these women in crisis pregnancies, no one who was adopting is praying, you know, God, please get somebody in this situation so that we can adopt their child. I mean, that's not what happens. What happens is that we, we know that they're going to the abortion clinics and we're saying, God, please redirect them. We will open our home to a child if you will redirect this woman so that she can choose a life for her child. And then we have to be so supportive of her and lift her up and lift the father up and the family up as they grieve because just like this little boy in the video, adoption is a place where joy and sorrow meet. So as joyful as this little boy was, it doesn't it break your heart that that small gift is all they have? And it's the same way with, with adoption. There is always a broken side and then as another family rejoices to have brought this child into their life. So it's really um, on our hearts to share the, the message with people that adoption is, may not be what God originally intended for family, but we live in a broken world and he's given us this opportunity to redeem this brokenness. And lastly, um, I'll just share an interesting story that when Laurel and I were up in Lynchburg, Virginia, we attended Thomas Road Baptist Church, which was founded by Dr. Jerry Falwell. And he also founded Liberty University, where Laurel is employed. And a reporter once asked uh, Dr. Falwell, you know, you say that you are pro-life and you oppose abortion. What is it that you are actually doing for that mission? And it got him to think, really, what am I doing about it? He founded what's called the Liberty Godparent Home. And in that, it is uh, a place where women who are pregnant, who may have nowhere else to turn,
can live there, they can go to school, they have their, um, their medical expenses provided for, and, and the goal of that is to bring that child to life. Now, whether or not they put that child up for adoption is not the primary focus, but it is an avenue and an outlet where as Christians, we can provide support and money to bring children to life. And so I just ask that you prayerfully consider what it is that you're doing. We're not saying that you need to open up your own Liberty Godparent home, but how can you minister and how can you support the sanctity of life? And um, another example, locally, I don't know if you all remember from the news, but there was um, a little girl who was in a domestic violence shelter with her mother and sadly her father killed her mother in front of her at a bus stop while she was waiting for the school bus and um, we know the family that has adopted that little girl but what is so amazing is the the adoptive mother's church family has rallied around her they've become respite foster care providers they 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 just decided to as a community come together there's a statistic that says if one family out of every three churches in america will bring in a foster child we can abolish the u.s foster care system one family out of every three churches that's totally doable if we start thinking about what god has called us to do for the least of these so we look forward to, sh to continuing to share our adoption journey with you all. Hopefully, prayerfully, one day very soon, we'll be standing here with a child. So, thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The scripture verse that uh, Ruth just alluded to, Psalm 139, is where this next song is taken from, as it says in the title, God Most High. And if you want to, you can turn to that passage in, the, in your Bible and follow along and uh, see where this exactly was taken from. Uh, Psalm 139, God Most High. God, you shape me from the inside. You formed me in my mother's womb. You know exactly how I was made. You know every breath I take. And I thank you, God most high. And I worship you alone. All your ways are wonderful that my soul knows well. That my soul knows open book you watch me grow all my days set out before you before there ever was a word on my tongue oh god you knew me completely and i thank you god most high and i worship you Alone. All your ways are wonderful That my soul knows well That my soul knows well You go before me and you follow me You pour out blessings on my head I thank you, God most high, and I worship you alone. All your ways are wonderful, that 
Bibles and would like to follow along. Our scripture verse is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And mine reads this way, I knew you before I formed you in my mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Let's pray. Father, this is an amazing passage. It's amazing that beyond what we can understand or comprehend, yet we know it's true. We believe it. We know that you knew us before we came into this world. You knew everything about us. You are the author of our story. So, Father, may we realize that if we're looking anywhere else other than to you to understand our story, then we are looking in the wrong place because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. You are the author of our story. You have written every word of it. And so, Father, may we not turn to a broken world with broken people to find out who we are. May we simply turn to you, the author of our story because you know us, and you knew us before we came to be. And we give you praise and honor and glory for this. And we pray this morning that you will speak to our hearts through our pastor, and that we will open our hearts to hear your voice. In Christ I pray. Amen. In January of 2012, Tina and I were invited to attend a private screening for a movie. It was for pastors and wives. A movie called October Baby. October Baby is a movie about an abortion survivor who went on a journey to find her birth mother. Amazingly, it's, it's based on a true story. The real person is Gianna Jensen. Jessen, excuse me, Gianna Jessen. She testified before Congress last September in the wake of the Planned Parenthood controversy. 
In the clip that you're about to see of the movie, Hannah, the main character, is talking to a priest about her conflicting emotions, her need to forgive, her need for forgiveness. You see, in Jesus Christ, there's hope. There's hope for healing. There's hope for forgiveness for anyone who has had an abortion or for anyone who has encouraged anyone to have an abortion. Sometimes we just need to forgive ourselves. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And sometimes we just need to believe that verse. Sometimes we just need to forgive ourselves. Watch this movie clip. I guess I'm trying to figure out how to let go of things. Things? Can't figure out how to let go of the fact that I feel hatred for myself and others. There, I said it. What is it that you want to say? Just say what you feel. Well, three weeks ago, I found out that my entire life is a lie. So I went on a trip. I thought if I went that I would get all these answers. And somehow when I got back, I would feel different. But I don't. My parents aren't really my parents. And my real parents tried to abort me. And I have a brother. Well, I had a brother. He died shortly after the hill. And angry at my parents for not telling me sooner and making me think that I was just like everybody else. I'm angry at my real mom for not wanting me. Why didn't she want me? What's so wrong with me? I found her. And she still doesn't want me. And I feel guilty. Part of me feels like... He should be alive. And I shouldn't. I wonder if he would have been a better person than me. What he would have been like. I just, I, I just hate myself for feeling this way. I see. This uh, cathedral was built in 1893, named for Magnificent. He wrote a letter to the church at Colossae and said, because we have been forgiven by God, we should forgive each other. In Christ you are forgiven. And because you are forgiven, you have the power to forgive. To choose to forgive. Let it go. <laughs> Hatred is a burden you no longer need to carry. Only in forgiveness can you be free, Anna. Forgiveness that is 
well beyond your grasp, or mine. <laughs> a forgiveness that you, you can't find on a trip, or even in this cathedral. But if the sun shall set you free, you will be free indeed. A baby in its mother's womb is just that, a baby. It's not a glob of meaningless, random cells. It's a life. And all life is precious to God. And the taking of any human life is a very serious thing. So to move forward, there must be Forgiveness. And sometimes we just need to forgive ourselves. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he was so sorrowful over the sinful condition of Judah. And God chose Jeremiah to be his prophet during some of the hardest times the hardest years in the history of Judah. God told Jeremiah that his life was precious and had, and had great value even before he was born. You see, all life, all human life is of infinite value to God and God has a unique plan for every single life that has ever been conceived. So what does it mean to be precious in the sight of God? We're going to look at three truths this morning about the sanctity of human life. First, we are known by God. The world tells us that, that human life is a random collection of, of, of cells that just happen to join together at just the right time to form an animal. A human being is just another animal. Now, they'll concede we're a special kind of an animal. I mean, we're on the top of the food chain. We don't see squirrels driving cars or flying airplanes. We're a special kind of an animal. But God told Jeremiah that he formed him while he was in his mother's womb. He formed you. While you were in your mother's womb. He formed me while I was in, our, in my mother's womb. And he formed us on purpose and he formed us for a purpose. You see, there's no such thing as an accidental pregnancy. There are only surprise pregnancies. Every conception of every child is orchestrated by the same God who created every star in the universe. And He knew us even while we were yet in our mother's womb. Psalm 139 and verse 16, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. What a beautiful song Richard sang just a few moments ago. Didn't you write that, Richard? Richard wrote that song. Isn't that a beautiful song? What a beautiful verse. See, to put it simply, as simply as we can, abortion stops a beating heart. That's what it does. A heart that we might not know, but a heart that God does. So what does it mean to be known by God? It means that we are in the realm of God's omniscience. Omniscience means all-knowing. 
God knows all about us. God knew us at the moment we were conceived. He'll know us when we breathe our last breath. God knew us from the time, that the very moment, the instant we were conceived. The Bible teaches life begins a conception. But didn't we already know that? I mean, really? Didn't we already know that? When Tina and I were expecting our children, we went to Tina's doctor's visits together. And the first several of those visits were listening events. We would listen to our baby's heart beating in Tina's womb. And you know what? No doctor we ever visited, no doctor we ever went to, hey, the doctor never said, you hear that sound? That's the sound of a random glob of cells that may or may not be a person. We never heard that. The doctor never referred to our child as a fetus. Guess what? The doctor referred to our child as a baby, as a person. So how can one child in his mother's womb be a baby and another not be? God knew us even while we were yet in our mother's womb. Well, secondly, we are sanctified by God. Both Bill and Hillary Clinton have said that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And even that's not enough for some pro-life advocates. On July the 9th, 2014, Jessica Valenti, a staff writer for The Guardian, a New York-based internet news outlet, wrote, and I quote, I support abortion rights. Being pro-choice means a lot of different things to me, among them that abortion should be safe, legal, accessible, subsidized, and provided with empathy and non-judgment. She continued, Safe, legal, and rare is not a framework that supports women's health needs. It stigmatizes it and endangers it, end quote. If pro-choice advocates are pro-women, then how can they ignore women's emotional needs? You see, the word that Jessica used there in her article that stands out to me is this word non-judgment. Now, maybe she's talking about from the outside, and maybe she's ignoring that from the inside. See, I think that's the truth. Because with abortion, there is a sense of judgment and a sense of guilt that has to be addressed. I've been a pastor 20 plus years. I've had many women and many men in my office weeping over this very issue. It's very difficult. Abortion is painful. It leaves scars. It's impossible. We can say what we want. It's impossible to ignore the physical, emotional, and mental pain caused by the choice to have an abortion. Non-judgment is impossible. And Jessica doesn't understand that or isn't willing to say that. We can attempt to hide self-judgment or guilt, but we can't remove it. There's nothing we can do to remove it. Only an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ can set us free from our sin. Jesus Christ is the only answer to sin, judgment, and guilt. He's the only answer. And God loves the woman and her male partner who may have decided to end a pregnancy with abortion. God loves them. And the church... We should love them too. 
just as God does. The Bible says we are sanctified by God even while we were in the womb. This word sanctified means to be holy. Every person ever conceived was created to be holy through a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and abortion stops a beating heart. That's what it does. Well, thirdly, we we are ordained by God. This word for ordain means to be set or to be placed. It carries a meaning of purpose. In other words, we were created on purpose and for a purpose. But let's talk about where the rubber hits the road. What happens when a woman has an unplanned pregnancy? What happens? Shouldn't there be alternatives to abortion? I mean, does the baby really have rights to life? You see, I don't understand why an abortion costs about $400 and an adoption costs about $40,000. I don't understand that. That's wrong. Abortion should be rare and adoptions should be plentiful. Abortion should cost $40,000. Adoption should cost $400. It's backwards. Some of the most famous, intelligent, creative people in the history of the world were adopted. Augustus Caesar was adopted. Eric Clapton doesn't always write the best lyrics, but the dude can flat play a guitar. He's gifted. Eric Clapton is is adopted. He was adopted. President Bill Clinton was adopted. President Gerald Ford was adopted. Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich was adopted. Singer Faith Hill was adopted. Her husband, Tim McGraw, yeah, him, he was adopted too. Ice skater Scott Hamilton was adopted. Beatle, John Lennon, he was adopted. Founding father, John Hancock, he was adopted. Computer genius, Steve Jobs, he was adopted. Human rights activist Nelson Mandela was adopted. Mary Monroe was adopted. Michael Ower from The Blind Side, of course, he was adopted. Edgar Allan Poe was adopted. Priscilla Presley was adopted. First Lady Nancy Reagan was adopted. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was adopted. Hey, Babe Ruth was adopted. Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, was adopted. Mother Teresa was adopted. And listen, I promise you, I could go on and on and on and on. I don't have to because you get the point. You get the point. Some of the most intelligent, creative, influential people that ever lived were adopted. God has used some of those people to, on that list and, some, and many, many others who I did not mention to be major factors in the shaping of our world. Almost 56 million Americans have been aborted since 1973. What if they'd have been adopted instead? Hey, what if half of them have been adopted? Understand many abortions happen on college campuses. Some of the brightest among us in our culture. We may have a cure for cancer by now. 
Diabetes may have been cured by now. Computers might be... Hey, do you remember those machines? Computers may be obsolete. Automobiles may be obsolete. Travel throughout the universe may be common. Could you imagine? But we'll never know. Because abortion stops a beating heart. Every life is beautiful. Every life is beautiful, inside the womb and out. So pray for an end to abortion. Pray for those who have had an abortion, that they'll find peace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Pray for families like the Shalers, who are waiting and saving to adopt a child. It's a sin that abortions can be on demand, but adoptions require thousands of dollars and years of waiting. So pray for our nation. Church, we need Jesus desperately. Desperately. Pray for our nation. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Our culture, our society is upside down. And only you can set us right. We pray for the woman that, that has an unplanned pregnancy and is afraid and doesn't know what to do. We pray, Lord, that you would steer her and guide her and give her the opportunity to see that baby through an ultrasound that she might make a decision for life. That that child might be adopted into a godly home, a loving home. Father, we pray for those who made it a choice for abortion, who at the time in their life felt like that was the best choice for them. And now they live with guilt in pain. And we intercede to you on their behalf and pray that you would be God of all comfort to them. We pray for our nation's leaders. You would open their eyes to truth. We pray for ourselves so you would, that you would open our eyes to to truth. And we'd stand on truth. Lord, you've opened our eyes this morning. And use us to encourage adoption over abortion and get that message out. Father, forgive us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for, for providing a way that we could be with you forever through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and there's never been a time in your life when you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, you have that opportunity today. Maybe you're a Christian, but you've never made a public profession of your faith. You've never been baptized. You come. We're going to have a baptism next Sunday. I just, I just found out this morning. We're going to have another baptism the following Sunday. How exciting. If you've never trusted Christ, do that today. you're a believer you've never been baptized why not? why? follow through
God has touched your heart today like he has mine. May you want to spend time where you are praying as God would lead you, maybe at the at this altar, maybe with me. Maybe you want to come and make an appointment to see me and talk to me about something, some of this that we talked about today. Maybe you want to talk to the sailors. They'll be happy to talk to you. They've learned a great deal in their journey. However God is leading, let's obey. Let's do what He calls us to do. So you come. Richard, come and lead us in an invitation. Can you please stand.